America. 1846, an audacious idea to grow and broadcast more knowledge than the world had ever seen. With an eye to the future, that dream was the Smithsonian. Your Smithsonian. Expanding the portrait of a people. Revealing the building blocks of life. To discover new species and save those we already know. A knowledge powerhouse with purpose and a community mindset. Inspiring a new generation to learn from the past. Speak up, be civic, serve a nation. So that together we can step into the future with optimism. No dreams deferred. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our program. This evening, we're going to be discussing uh, museums and the advancement of equity and understanding. What is the role of museums in the advancement of equity and understanding in our country? And we'll be joined by a group of uh, our Smithsonian leaders to talk about that subject. Um, you know, our Smithsonian uh, and our history museums really are repositories of the American memory. Um, and we believe that with a more complete understanding of our shared past, we can shape our shared future and make it one in which equity and equality of opportunity are the central features of our society. And to that end, we welcome you this evening. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Alan Curtis, the president of the Eisenhower Foundation. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you to the Smithsonian for this event. And thank you for the Mellon Foundation for its support. The National Museum of African American History and Culture's exhibition, Reckoning, Protest, Devi Defiance, Resilience, features a portrait of Breonna Taylor done posthumously by Amy Sherrod, who painted the official portrait of Michelle Obama. Uh, the uh, Breonna Taylor painting is a powerful, elegant, and psychologically direct statement on reckoning in America. It is also about Black Lives Matter and 2020 and George Floyd. The painting's meaning carries America back, Black as well, to the disturbances of the 1960s in Detroit, Newark, Chicago, Los Angeles, Washington, and 150 other American cities around the nation. Whites tended to call uh, the 1960s disturbances riots. People of color called them protests. For the most part, the same differences in framing hold true today. In response to the 60s protests, President Lyndon Johnson formed the Bipartisan Kerner Commission, which concluded that the underlying cause was white racism. The commission advised it is time to make good the promise of American democracy to all citizens, urban and rural, black and white, Spanish surname, American Indian, and every minority group, I'm quoting them directly. Tonight, it is still time to make good the promise of democracy to all Americans. In healing our divided society, the Eisenhower Foundation's 50-year update of the Kerner Commission, we concluded that America has made relatively little progress in reducing racial injustice, economic inequality, and poverty, and in many ways, we have gone backwards. Since the Kerner Commission, deep poverty, income inequality, wealth inequality, public school segregation, and mass incarceration of people of color has increased. White nationalist movements have strengthened, as we saw in Charlottesville. The Capitol building in Washington was invaded 
on J January 6th, the pandemic has made things disproportionately worse for people of color and the truly disadvantaged. Nevertheless, over the past 50 years, the nation has built up considerable evidence on economic, education, public health, justice, youth development, housing, and other policies that work. Yet, as we have talked around the nation on Kerner and healing, we have found that the public does not, for the most part, understand that we know a lot about what doesn't work and that policy needs to be based on evidence and science, not on dogma and supposition. Surely the importance of evidence is a theme that carries across all of the Smithsonian museums. We also have learned a great deal about what doesn't work, like zero tolerance policing, mass incarceration of people of color, and willful indifference to the unequal distribution of prosperity. Most of all, what doesn't work includes false rhetoric on government being the problem. But now, to the contrary, and based on the evidence, we need to advocate for a more activist public sector, I believe, that recognizes Kerner priorities and scales up what works. It is time, I suggest, to seize the day, renegotiate the social contract, restructure basic power equations, and change the rules of the game. The goal is not to get back to normal. Normal has been the problem in America. We have, in fact, already uh, reversed false rhetoric on government. 2020 hosted the largest expansion of federal financial activity in American history, and the momentum continues in 2020 and 2021. At the same time, in order to seize the day, to scale up what works, and to scale down what doesn't work, we still need what the Kerner Commission called New Will way back in 1968. How then can we create new will in our divided society? That is one of the most important questions of our time. Many say that generating new will begins with ensuring the right to vote, and I agree. Many go on to say that generating new will can in part be a function of the humanities, the arts, museums, and higher learning institutions. Martin Luther King, Dolores Huerta, John Lewis, Cesar Chavez, created cultural change in the 1960s, change that was facilitated, visualized, and amplified by museums and other cultural institutions, by the visual arts, and by the performing arts. That cultural change helped influence public sector legislation, like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. In turn, that legislation created more cultural change and more legislation. Cultural impacts policy, and policy impacts culture. To better define the power of this cause and effect process that can help create new will and so heal our divided society, we are collaborating on events with cultural visionaries. We then will assemble lessons learned and report back to the Mellon Foundation on a possible national strategy. So for example, we will be asking the directors of the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, how they can better focus their prestigious international institutions on the people who will benefit most from the priorities of the Kerner Commission. We will be doing the same with grassroots organizations that use the arts to further their Kerner um, uh, aligned visions, like Expo in Chicago and the Laundromat Project in Brooklyn. We soon will be asking Harvard professor of African American studies and art, Sarah Lewis, to build on her vision and justice project to suggest how photo images in the public realm can advance the priorities of Kerner and Healy. In the performing arts, we have received the insights of Mark Mamuthi Joseph, vice president for social impact at the Kennedy Center and the Asian Pacific perspectives of Roberto Uno, Director of Arts in a Changing America. We have just completed an event with Bishop William Barber and his colleagues on the Poor People's Campaign. The campaign is a diverse moral fusion movement that has embraced white Appalachian coal miners, Latinx border immigrants, and African-American gospel. 
Bishop Barber reflected uh, with us that the sanity of any movement is contingent upon the strength of its song. Sometimes the pain is so great you need to begin with music, he said. Bishop Barber recalled how important Aretha Franklin and Mahalia Jackson were to Dr. King. We have held an event with the American Academy of Poets featuring poet laureate Joy, Joy Harjo and former poet laureate Tracy K. Smith, as well as a LULAC event on Latinx culture and an event keynoted by then Congresswoman Deb Haaland, who now of course is the first uh, Native American Secretary of the Interior. In November, we will share our findings with the National Humanities Conference. And now we are honored by the wisdom of the Smithsonian. So I ask tonight's panel, is there or can there be a cause and effect strategy that leads from a collaborative museum innovation and artistic innovation to measurable cultural change in America? And can that cultural change embody new will that then leads to measurable reductions in racial injustice, economic inequality, and poverty? As part of such a cause and effect strategy, will young people on the south side of Chicago, in South Central LA, and in the South Bronx travel to DC? to see the Breonna Taylor portrait and the powerful Smithsonian exhibition on racial and economic reckoning, most will not, not be able to. Does that mean the portrait and the exhibition must be creatively projected on the Smithsonian website? And what is the role of our deeply imperfect social media? Do we as well focus on how local and smaller museums across the nation can attract people at least as well as large prestigious national museums? Do we expand the Art for Justice Fund strategy in which the arts are used to inspire collaborative grassroots organizing by nonprofit groups to reduce racial injustice, economic inequality and poverty, to further Black Lives Matter and to further the Poor People's Campaign? Do we try to motivate those cultural institutions called universities to apply academic knowledge more effectively in the communities where they are located. For example, by replicating Bard College's premier college behind bars prison education model. Do we build on how foundations like Mellon and Ford are expanding fellowships for practitioners of color in the arts and the humanities? And does the movement not need to focus to target multiple audiences, as Director Young has suggested in a June guest essay in the New York Times. In 1968, before he was assassinated, Dr. King was uh, forming a new coalition among all races and most classes. Today, we need to motivate believers in Kerner and healing priorities to continue the struggle. But we also need to communicate to independents and fence sitters, as well as to Americans who may be opposed to Kerner and healing priorities, like at least some whites living in poverty, and like state legislators who have passed voter suppression laws. When he announced the new Smithsonian Initiative on Racial Reckoning, Secretary Bunch concluded that the only way to find a shared future was to engage and to debate. He promised, quote, we will be testing ideas testing different kinds of collaborations, testing de different technology. He concluded that he hoped the testing will make the country better and also the Smithsonian better. At this moment of intense debate on the shared future of our democracy, it is with Secretary Bunch's collaborative spirit that we dedicate our convening tonight. Thank you for that, uh, Alan, and, and uh, thanks for all of those uh, provocative questions. We're going to attempt to answer at least a few of them uh, this evening. So with that, let me introduce some of my Smithsonian colleagues. Uh, first, uh, Theo Gonsalves. 
is a curator at the National Museum of American History and is currently serving as the acting director of the Asian Pacific American Center. Uh, Te Mariana Nunn is uh, the director of the American Women's History Initiative at the Smithsonian. Deborah Mack is the director of our initiative titled Our Shared Future, Reckoning with Our Racial Past. Kevin Young is the director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And Anthea Hardick is the director of the National Museum of American History. So thank you all for joining us tonight. So why don't we uh, just jump right into uh, to the question that, that Alan has posed to us. And I'll start with you, Kevin. Um, what can museums, and, and more specifically, what can the Smithsonian collection of museums and, uh, and research centers do to advance equity and understanding in a country that seems to be terribly divided right now? Well, thanks a lot, Kevin. Um, it is a big question, but I think it's one that the Smithsonian's tackling in our shared futures, but also, you know, we think about it a lot at uh, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, a few things we've done specifically and then a, pro a broader point, I think. One is that uh, museums can help us understand that this is a precedented time, at least that's what I refer to it as. You know, sometimes we think of it as out of the blue, the past. Uh, and of course, the, the framing of the question and thinking of the Kerner Commission helps us realize this is an ongoing concern. But even thinking 100 years ago, uh, when the museum was uh, starting to be uh, wrestled over as an idea, uh, and it took 100 years to build, um, I think that even then, you know, we had questions of pandemic, we had uh, the Tulsa race massacre, uh, red summer of 1919. And so to think back on that, I think, and to connect the dots for people is I think very important to help contextualize the moments we're in and have deep conversations about those moments. Um, I remember encountering the Tulsa massacre uh, exhibition that's part of our permanent ex exhibit at the museum when I was just a visitor and it was so moving and powerful. And what I think was powerful in that uh, is not just telling the story of what happened and showing postcards, horrible postcards that people posted of the destruction, but also showing the testimony uh, of survivors. I think that was really important to give that voice. Um, and the Kerner uh, commission quote about making good the promises also helps me think about the the originator of that quote frederick Douglass, and that titles make good the promises titles one of our most recent shows on reconstruction and its legacies and what i like about that show um, that just opened last month for our fifth anniversary is it thinks about not just reconstruction and time when a lot of these questions are coming to the fore about who can vote uh, where can people live uh you know are people going to get compensated for their losses? How do we talk about finance and, and you know, some of those questions that are with us today? But we also have this legacy section that thinks about that too. And it's a very powerful section, which has everything from uh, the stained glass taken out of the National Cathedral that uh, represented Robert E. Lee, uh, which was there until very recently, uh, to uh, last effects from survivors of the Emanuel massacre and also Trayvon Martin's last effects. And I think the power I see when I visit those collections and see people interacting with them and, and really overcome in many ways is they're seeing how much this is relevant to their lives. And I think we have to continue to help people to understand the historic context, but also the ongoing conversation and the everyday concerns. Uh, you know, people are coming in um, with their own things that they're dealing with and wrestling with. And these questions they want addressed in museums. And that's what we find in people from all over the world who visit the Smithsonian. And um, Anthea, uh, so these, these events of the past couple of years have really, um, mm -hmm. really shaken us up. So uh, how is it, has it, has it shaken up the National Museum of American <laughs> History? Are you doing things differently in the aftermath of, uh, of a pandemic and the, the murder of George Floyd? No, thank you, Kevin. And thank you, uh, my brother, Director Kevin, for so beautifully articulating um, what the National Museum of African American History and Culture is doing. Um, I've been honored to lead now the American History Museum, the, the kind of the big old white flagship museum, if you will, 
for longer in COVID than I did in the before time. So it's been an incredible test of our new mission, which was created with um, significant community uh, input, is empowering people to create a more just and compassionate future by exploring, preserving, and sharing the complexities of our past. And it's, it, it aims at a big kind of tenure goal of having the people we interact with, people we welcome to represent the demographies of the nation. So imagine that's our new mission statement and then um, the pandemic hits and the cascading crises, racial, viral, economic, constitutional, climate are all kind of brought to the fore. So it's definitely changed the way in which we um, perceive our work, um, the dedication we have to our new mission. We have brought forth um, for the first time what we think is one of the only um, uh, internship programs with formerly incarcerated individuals from the Goucher Prison Education Program to what you mentioned, Alan at Bard, in a museum setting and we're launching the Center for Restorative History that really aims to combine the principles and the methodologies of restorative justice with those of public history, with what we know how to do, collect, remember, interpret, um, and be very mindful of the harm that we've done, even as the Smithsonian, as well as the good that we can do uh, in moving forward uh, to help heal the nation. So it's been, a, I think, a truly remarkable set of, of changes and I'm so struck by the Alice in Wonderland comment uh, at the end of the Kerner Commission report by none other than Kenneth B. Clark when he says, oh yeah, I read that report of the 1919 riot in Chicago, the report investigating the, um, the Harlem riot of 1943, the report of the Cone Com Com Commission, the Watts riot. And uh, I must say in candor again, it's kind of Alice in Wonderland. So I see it as our responsibility to, to break that to help break that chain, to create those new narratives, those new monuments, um, those new histories, really, that tell a broadly inclusive and very complex past. And not to lose hope in our own agency. I think James Baldwin had that great quote that no one can take away your responsibility or something similar to that. So, thanks. Yeah, and that, that brings this to mind, Deborah, that um, museums are, are also changing, have been changing, and are continuing to change in terms of their relationship uh, with, uh, with the communities that surround them and even communities that are, that are distant from them. So, um, and your work in particular, both at the African American Museum and now as, as the director of Our Shared Future, um, how, how are you imagining the, the future uh, relationships? between institutions like our Smithsonian museums and these communities out there in the world who are facing these, these daunting problems? Well, the, this work is new in one way and not new at all in other ways. As you're very well aware, so many of the Smithsonian museums have had ongoing relationships with their own constituents, their own communities of, of, of relevance and of collecting of shared memory. I think what is new about this initiative is that it's the first time that we have a completely pan-Smithsonian approach where it's not just the National Museum of American History which has been doing this or the African American History and Culture Museum or the Asian American and Asian Pacific Program, but it's also the Air and Space Museum and the Postal Museum and all of the research centers and museums that are looking collaboratively uh, and pan institutionally at what they can be doing, not just in their own right, but with their partners who they've already been serving. I think one of the motivations of this initiative is to also reposition Smithsonian as a leading partner, not as a leader per se. Clearly Smithsonian has unmatched capacity, convening capacity, interdisciplinary capacity, um, and wealth of incredible collections, objects, archives, resources that we can bring to bear on this. But this work has to be done if it's going to have any sustainability in collaboration with our partners on the ground who know their communities in face-to-face -face ways that we cannot. We do in some instances, but by working with partner institutions and organizations, and often that is museums and archives and libraries, but also community organizations, activist organizations, we are able to amplify their work to sometimes provide credibility and legitimacy, in other words, currency to their work. If we can work with them, we are also learning from them. 
because I believe that this kind of work, this racial justice work, which is multi-generational, which precedes the founding of this country, is interdisciplinary and it's ongoing and it's collective. So this has been, we're currently moving through a really difficult period again in our history, not unprecedented as a uh, colleague Kevin Young has indicated, but at the same time, if we continue to work in a collaborative way with organizations on the ground, and they do this even better than we do um, by listening to where they are and what they know, by also engaging in this work in, I'd say, very multicultural ways, in differently linguistic ways, in ways that resonate where, where our, our communities are, where they live where they are even intellectually around this. We don't want to have another cycle of communities feeling that they are being told how they should think, what they should do, where individuals may feel not necessarily welcome or not identify with this work, um, where they may feel that they're the bad guy in this, in this kind of work. This is for all of us collectively. I think that Smithsonian across the board and working with all the organizations that do this work every day, all day in face-to-face -face ways and have done so for a very long time can really play a large role in amplifying the resources and the goodwill and the social justice and the resources that are already out there. Theo, could you talk a bit about, uh, about the Asian Pacific American Center and specifically um, how its work has changed perhaps in response to these twin pandemics of, uh, of COVID-19 and um, a seemingly a seeming increase in, in uh, violence against people of color and in particular violence against Asian American people. Sure. Yeah, thank you for the question, Kevin. Um, you know, at the Asian Pacific American Center, it's it's um, going to be entering its 25th year of work at the Smithsonian. Um, and it's been doing this journey level work of trying to tell these stories of a very complicated group, which is now the fastest growing racial minority in the country, um, coming from disparate locations in Asia, but really having a mark in the United States and throughout the Americas uh, for quite a long time, for centuries long. Um, how has it affected the, how has the last two years affected our communities. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a story of shock and misery um, and woe. And ultimately it, it is in the same way that, that Kevin and, and Deborah have been describing, this is not a new story. Asian Americans are not new to the Americas. Uh, these are very old stories. And when we talk about this season, this season of hatred and violence in which Asian faces are now targets, again, we have to come to this moment where we understand that this is a place that we have been before. This is a cycle. And the, the sooner we get to understanding that this is a cycle of history, um, it, it puts us in a different relationship, not just Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. I think there should be a lesson really for all Americans and all persons who are thinking about visiting a, a museum or thinking about history. History is not something that is bad. Something, it is not something that is in the past. So if we can riff on that Faulkner comment, uh, I think we all need a new relationship with history um, because what we're trying to convey, whether it's African-American native stories, uh, Chicano Latino stories, Asian Pacific American stories, is these stories um, are about the present as well. They're about how we have been here. We have been, all of us have been here before. And so our responses might be different, um, but some of our responses are actually quite the same. And I think when we dig into uh, Asian Pacific American history, one of the things that we also want to convey is that we are more than what has been done to us. We have to be more than just the victimization of our history. We are the sum total of our solidarities with each other. And that is a different kind of story. That's also an American story. That's a Pacific Islander story. That's a story about people standing up for each other, standing with each other. And as Japanese Americans think about decades long, years after the, inter the internment, how they see um, their own histories reflected with children at the border uh, in cages. That's an act of solidarity that goes across racial groups, ethnic groups, that goes across generations. That's a historical and a teaching, a teachable moment. And that's a, the kind of conversation that I think 
um, a place like the Smithsonian can foster and facilitate uh, a new way to think about history. Uh, because I think so often we are, we, uh, we're tired of it, we're bored of, of the subject, we claim that we don't like history, um, but this, for many of us, this is really how we, we find life and joy in the struggle. Uh, we find joy in these stories um, and not just happiness. I'm talking about true deep-seated joy because they represent deep traditions when you can stand for and with each other. So I think these past two years have really been a real challenge for a lot of our communities. We're still facing it. Um, and, and as I think about October, it's Filipino American History Month. I think about those Filipino Americans in the medical field that have been on the front lines. Um, they are 4% of the nursing uh, core in the United States, but there's 30% of COVID deaths. That is a shocking statistic to deal with in the present. And yet it has uh, a past that goes all the way to the US Philippine war in the early part of the 20th century. Why don't we learn more about this? There's more of our history to learn. There's more of our connection to learn. And the better we can be connected to each other, the better we can unravel our sense of what these solidarities mean. Yeah, I mean, we're going to come back to uh, come back around on on this idea of a, of a shared narrative. But but first, um, I want to bring Tay into the conversation and say, so where does where does women's history fall in this conversation uh, about social justice and and um, and how we how we present and understand history? Well, thank you, thank you, Kevin. It's so great to be with my colleagues. I mean gender intersects with all of this, right? Um, and I was listening to uh, a tour, a video tour of the new Hung Lu exhibit, which uh, is at the National Portrait Gallery, and I highly recommend. And she starts off sort of echoing what Theo says, which is um, history is not a noun, it's a verb because it's going on right now. And I just thought it was a new way of saying it. I really enjoyed that, but it it, it brings the, the shared past that we're talking about, the Smithsonian, the shared future. Um, but for me, it also means like, you know, a shared imagination about how we're going to do this. And the Women's History Initiative, like the Race Initiative, um, works with all of the uh, Smithsonian entities in, in, in recovering, researching, uh, and amplifying and disseminating the voices of women. And this intersects with everything. I mean, the the work that we're doing can be so micro as to be doing Wikipedia edathons to uh, to to change the narrative in Wikipedia and the times that women's uh, uh, histories are told through the Smithsonian collections, to really sort of macro discussions about oh I don't know everything from from space making and why that can create communication whether that's virtual or physical. Um, and how gender influences that or how gender can be gender, uh, the discussions around gender and, and women's voices can be amplified through that. Um, I was just reflecting, you know, as, as a Latina and, and working with the Women's History Initiative, I keep on looking at all these things in the news and just, you know, I, I think it was October 21st was a day that commemorates um, Latina Equal Pay Day, right? It takes mm -hmm. 10 months to to 10 months for Latinas to make the, the money that that an Anglo man would have made in, in 20, uh, uh, 20. So it takes 10 months into the year 2021. And then those are things that we really, you know, museums and libraries and cultural institutions, whether virtually or physically in a space, um, uh, need, you know, have a social responsibility to investigate and, and address and sort of any sort of any sort of interpretation that's made public you know, in a museum is, is, is a statement in a way, right? And we, and, and it invites dialogue and whether again, that's virtually or physically, and we need to be sure of talking about the virtual realm, you know, museums are, are considered trusted, trusted members of community and, and we need to facilitate all these dialogues. Um, and the, uh, it, it would appear right now there is no common understanding of what the American story is. That 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 in fact we do not share uh, an understanding of what our past is, which leads me to wonder: Is do you think it's even possible to construct an American narrative upon which we all agree? Well, 
That's a wonderful question. Can we construct an American narrative upon which I'll agree? Um, this has been debated, of, of course, um, as you know, from the rise of um, word, the word and the practice of history. Um, I think that it's possible for us to create a very complicated landscape of interwoven narratives in which we see the intersections, like to one of Theo's great points, where we understand the solidarities, where we've known we've come together uh, to make change, where we've, we've, we've created opportunities for each other. Um, Without the reckoning, however, um, which I know we're all using quite a bit, but it's a very powerful action verb, as as is uh, as is history, okay? um, historia for the Greeks, right? The act of inquiry. Um, I think we have to address some of the core, um, phenomenally challenging roadblocks to that. White nationalism, obviously. I mean, going going back to the subject of tonight and why the work of this. Of, this effort is so critical. And once you read the Kerner Commission report again, it is astounding that what they had immediately picked up on as the this kind of duplicative um, Alice in Wonderland, as I mentioned previously, but really the ways in which um, change has not happened and change has been resisted. Um, so I think less about a grand sweeping American narrative. I think that's such a part of um, the hegemon and progressive understanding of the American past. And I think much more about the complicated challenges and weave to that. Um, and as Secretary Bunch challenged us, you know, to let us use history to hold the nation up to its loftiest ideals. And I think about that a lot as we approach you know, the semi-quincentennial, the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence and really what those truths were that we held to be self-evident and that all men, as you know, and women were created unequal in the eyes of those who created that document. So it is for um, it is a, an extreme challenge, and I think it's it's maybe not the, even the right question to answer um, or, or to ask in in the sense that it takes us back into that kind of a um, of a grand sweeping mono narrative. But I'd love to know what my colleagues think. I I think about this quite a bit. I think there's a big, big tent for uh, for the type of stories, for the type of artifacts that we collect. We yeah. collected the, the beautifully folded cranes, right? We collected these cranes that were done by the families and turned families themselves. Martyr fence that was constructed. Uh, that was immediately kind of 2020. And so just think of the story that those cranes tell as, as the weave of, um, of the intersection of people standing up for each other um, in times where their human rights um, were so jeopardized and when they were subject to such violence and hatred. So I don't know if I answered your question well, but. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I mean, my, my mind wanders on, on that subject all the time. So I'm gonna have uh, Kevin pin it all down for us. Um, so what, what then is the role of museums like the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Museum of the American Indian, our new National Museum of the American Latino in creating this, uh, this complicated weave that, that, uh, that Theo and, and, and Anthea have been talking about? How do we, you know, do we do we need all these different museums in order to be able to do it? I mean, what what? How do we do this? Well, I think it's a, a yes, <laughs> we do. Um, I think it's a short answer, but um, you know, I, I think a lot about how the museum and and I'll just take our museum as a starting point helps us see ourselves and then see each other. And I see that every day when I come in and you see people of all stripes and all walks of life going through the museum and being transformed by it. And I think people want 
these museums as a place of discovery, uh, learning about themselves. I learn something every time I'm in the space, um, but also about each other. And, and I think that's really important. Um, I, a Secretary Bunch, my predecessor in the museum and the founding director always uh, says it so well about, you know, we provide an Africa, African American lens on American history and that American story. Um, I also think there's a real opportunity in the museum to think about how we can collect what's happening now and the newness, uh, collecting the now and the new is something I've been saying. Um, and thinking about history as living and indeed living history has also come to the fore as something we've been talking about a lot at the museum because we are living through history, history is living in us um, and things uh, like the Breonna Taylor portrait and the reckoning show we we put up uh, really thinks about the past five years, say, uh, happens to be the five years we've been open, but also it's been a transformative time and seeing the artwork that I think has been created in this time, but also has been created over a century uh, that's featured in the show really thinks about the ways that African Americans are engaged in history and art history. Um, and I think that aspect of culture too, I would bring to the floor. We've been talking a lot about history. Um, I would mention culture as, you know, obviously they're interrelated, but I think what uh, the museum shows is the ways that artists and African American everyday folk created food, they created music, they created many bombs and resistances to some of the uh, difficulties they face um, and out of them. And I think it's really important, uh, you know, when I walked in the museum and saw basically the pot my grandmother cooked all her good food in, I, I saw myself mm -hmm. and I also tasted uh, <laughs> some meals I <coughs> missed quite a bit. Um, but I also think about, you know, she made uh, a stew once and I remember asking what the fish was and she said it was gar. I said gar and you know, gar is this bottom feeder, just terrible uh, fish, uh, if you know, and she, it tasted like, you know, name your favorite uh, delicious high end fish. Um, and I think that was transformation uh, is part of the cultural uh, thing that people want to experience in the museum. They want to experience that kind of transformation, that kind of recognition. And sometimes it is a reckoning. Um, and I think of the, the reckoning in the big sense of to reevaluate, to reconsider, but also the African-American uh, idea of, you know, I'm going to reckon something, I'm going to think about it, um, and, and also to see. And so those, those aspects are really coursing through, I think, where we are at now and where we can be in the future. And so, Tay, you worked at the uh, Hispanic Cultural Center in, in New Mexico. Um, do you see it that way too? That 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 what we're really doing is viewing the same things through 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 different eyes when we have these different museums. Um, I think that that you know eth ethnic specific museums or 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 uh, you know subject specific museums really arose out of a need. Um, and probably at the same time this report was issued that we're talking about, um, about a need for a place and space of our own, keep on, keep on uh, repeating place and space, but that, you know, it arose from a need because mainstream institutions weren't, weren't showing the differences, right? They were showing the, the, the sort of solid tale and, and show and, and relating history depends on who the storyteller is, right? who is the chronicler, who is the person in charge, who's the person in power. So when we have museums in which we can do sort of deep dive community work in those fields, when mainstream museums don't have the uh, capacity or perhaps the, the expertise on staff, which is completely changing museums now, but in the past, um, I think you need both because I think there's too many stories to tell not to have both simultaneously. So with the Women's Museum and with the Women's Initiative, we have a lot more uh, 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 stories to tell that we'll be able to tell throughout the Smithsonian and within the Physical Museum. Yeah. Um, so Theo, uh, Alan Curtis was challenging us in, in his opening comments to um, to find ways to measure impact. And what are your thoughts about, uh, about how museums would go about judging the, the quantity and quality of impact that we're having on, um, on, on these communities and on these conversations? Sure, uh, it's a great question. Well, a lot of that can be um, uh, uh, dealt with in terms of 
uh, better uh, quantitative tools that allow us to, to survey who's coming into the museum. Uh, but you know, Secretary Bunch also has made uh, quite a big deal about the fact that uh, to be uh, to be on the mall to have feet into the um, in, into the various units uh, is is not enough. the The idea of the Smithsonian being able to reach a billion people a year really has to be done digitally. Um, and and there's going to be a lot of information that that the Smithsonian can learn. Uh, and I think one of the things that that um, that can be brought about um, and understood is is um, is a sense of I, I think traditions and and communities that have been waiting to be represented at the Smithsonian for a very long time. Uh, I think we have to be real about also the institution in which we work. There's there's a lot of reparative work that this institution has to come to grips with. How it has, um, like many museums, uh, they functioned as, as institutions of extraction, as institutions of hierarchy, uh, to uphold certain hierarchies in, in life, in culture, in policy. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm very thankful to be in the company of, of these fellow directors because they're, they get the notion of what reparative work means. It's not simply doing the work that they're doing, but it's also having to undo the work of what has been done where people have been misrepresented, have been insulted, have been cast out, and, and the communities themselves from coast to coast, island to island, they've been waiting for a chance to tell their stories. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm thankful to be, uh, to be able to work with the Asian Pacific American Center because I think you know, one of the, the stories that we are having to think about when we think about community impact um, is, is in the middle of this crisis of this pandemic and then also the anti-Asian violence that we've been uh, thinking about. I think about this example of the anti-sewing squad out in California on the West Coast, mostly Asian American women who realized that there was a crisis afoot state and market had fallen apart, supply chains were broken, people needed very practical things, elastic, fabric, distribution systems, and hundreds of mostly women, starting with Asian American women, but really progressing from there to thousands of people, created um, um, a, a group to, to address what was absolutely needed, per, uh, personal protective equipment, masks. And they did so with, with the idea that, uh, with an understanding that this is not charity. Let's not talk about charity in the middle of a crisis. This is mutual aid. This is what we need right now at this particular moment. So by hook or crook, it's the hustle in them uh, because they prove that aunties get stuff done. Uh, and, and this becomes an Asian American tradition. So when I think about Christina Wong and Valerie So, it's an inspiring tradition because it allows me to think, along with all of you uh, museum practitioners here, allows us to think about the other traditions of what mutual aid has meant that allows us to find a shared narrative. I don't think we need a single story of America. We need multiple stories of what our solidarities are about, about what our mutual aid traditions are about. Benevolent societies during Jim Crow, uh, food um, uh, programs for young children, or uh, health clinics for seniors or community uh, job boards for, um, uh, for, for folks in, in different neighborhoods. All of those represent uh, different kinds of traditions, not simply Asian American and Pacific Islander. They stretch across traditions. And it's, I think it's up to us to help unlock some of these stories so that we, people can understand. These are stories that, that we had at the ready. And some of them have been buried because we've, we've decided to think about something else about who we think we are. But how did we get here? We got here because of those shared traditions um, of, of mutual aid. And we cannot forget what moment we're in. That's the moment that I think the Sewing Squad reminds me of. We're still in the middle of the crisis. What's the role of the historian? I hope we can continue to help unlock that. A mirror, um, the Smithsonian Indian Museum is, it really serves as a, a mirror uh, so that when people can see themselves in the way that Kevin is talking about. But it's also a light. It can shine a light to other cultures, other communities, other regions and neighborhoods and we could say, I see myself in different parts of this country. Um, and, and, and thank goodness that there was a museum that allowed me to see that. Yeah, I think aunties are one of those things that really are uh, universal, right? We all, uh, we all have aunties and, and they all uh, fill that role for us. Um, Deborah, uh, one of the most startling statistics I, I've read in the past few years uh, is that there are more museums in the United States than there are Starbucks and McDonald's stores combined. 
And uh, it, it really had never, it had never occurred to me, but when you start looking for them, there are museums everywhere. And so, um, so obviously, even as, as large and, and, uh, um, and, and grand as the Smithsonian is, um, we're, we're not so large uh, when compared to the sum total of the museums out there in our country. So in, in working on your initiative, how are you thinking about, um, about engaging with those local institutions and really, uh, really um, uh, it, uh, working with them to, uh, to, to try to achieve some of our objectives? Well, as you said, there, there, are, there are so many. Not all of them are involved or even interested in what we might call social justice work that still leaves not only dozens, that leaves hundreds of partners, many of whom our various programs already have relationships with. Um, as I had mentioned before, there are museums that have been doing this work. We could call it social justice work. We can call them civil rights museums. The Wing Luke Museum in Seattle, the National Japanese American Museum in, in uh, California. There are larger and smaller, and many of them community focused, neighborhood focused, because they decided that they would serve very directly constituents who did not find services, did not find representation, did not find um, ways to be heard elsewhere, uh, whether they addressed and focused themselves on very specific and pressing issues or larger issues of self-representation and creativity, um, the, the bottom line of economics, you name it. We have, we, one of the, the great advantages of this initiative is that we are inheriting multiple relationships because of Theo's work, because of Te Mariana's work, because of the work of many others that have worked with Smithsonian. So they begin to understand who we are and what we do and what we don't do, have confidence in telling us what we could be doing better, are teaching us how to listen better, and have enough trust with us to allow us to work and try out to experiment with them and through them because they can really act as in many ways interpreters on some of these other national goals that we may have. Uh, again, I feel the Smithsonian will learn as much from these museums, the thousands of museums that exist around the country where, and, and many places Smithsonian has not yet ventured as anything else. Um, and we see this as a great opportunity. I think not only the, the multidisciplinary nature of this, but in a sense, the truly multicultural nature of this across class, across region and geography, across political leaning is a major opportunity for Smithsonian to even more fully represent the nation, represent who we are. Yeah. Um I'm going to ask everyone for for some closing thoughts, but I, I really want to focus around uh, again around the, the fundamental subject of, of our of our conversation, and that is um, we are all part of this um, uh, this this very large uh, institution, um, and in that respect, we have resources and and uh, and access to. Um, to resources that, that very few others do. We really are in a privileged position. So how, how do we, what is our responsibility to deploy uh, these resources um, to the cause of equity and equality in our country? We could choose not to, could we not? So do we have, what is our obligation in that respect? And I'll start with Theo. Um, that's a great question. You know, I, I, I think about uh, one of the most important documents I, I think that's ever been written. That's the letter from Birmingham jail by, by Dr. King. Uh, and, and it was a note that was created out of, out of sheer frustration because he's thinking about how white liberal ministers are telling him to wait, that his tactics um, uh, demanded another kind of, of response and, and he was thinking about 1963, but he's thinking about 1863. And the question is, how long do you want it to wait? I think those of us in the museum have to act on the certain and a similar agency uh, and urgency, which is we cannot wait to tell these stories. 
uh, just like Kevin Young, we cannot wait to collect these items to tell that history. It has to be done now. And just like when I, you know, I tell my partner when I come home um, and I tell her that I love her, I, I tell her I love her. I don't. It's not like I love you tomorrow. I, I, I love you next week. It's, it's about the present. That is a performative statement about, about the value of what it means to be in the present. And we can bring that sense of, of that kind of love to our practice. It has to be uh, as urgent um, uh, as, as, as how we love. And, and so that for me should be the ethic that, that should guide us. Uh, we're not gonna, we cannot hold back, we cannot wait. And, and Dave, what's your answer to that question? What is our obligation? I think we don't have a choice. I think we're absolutely obligated uh, to make more equitable uh, history or stories of, of, of what you call America, the Americas. Um, you know, we, we have to have different perspectives and they have to be pulled in different ways. It's, it can't be through one person's lens or can't be through an old fashioned, old fashioned guys. And, and, and what we have to do is, is move backwards and look at even just how we describe, we're looking at how gender has been described historically in Smithsonian catalogs. So we have to look backwards, go fix that so that we can move forward with it fixed. Does that make sense? And we just, you know, we have an incredible team working on this. And, and I think we, we don't, we don't have a choice. We have, we have to act. Deborah, I mean, did you get into the museum business in order to be an agent of social change? Actually, absolutely. <laughs> that was um, when I was invited to create a department that would support and, and amplify the work of African American museums around the country. When I joined the African American Museum of History and Culture, it was specifically with that charge. I had declined the that offer the first two times when it was a general wouldn't you like to join the smithsonian because i'd seen a long time what smithsonian practice was and how it could take a hundred years to do something but given a charge that was very clear and given a charge that basically said you know that an activist stance and engaged community stance a listening and collaborative stance would be totally appropriate um, and that was the history that I brought to the museum. Um, it's been really excellent. It's been great to bring on the next two generations of practitioners, um, of, of staff in, in, in a, across Smithsonian to see them engage in this work in ways that actually reinforces their activism, their sense of equity, their sense of social justice. Um, and in a sense that also tells them that where they, when they come to Smithsonian, they can bring their total selves to Smithsonian. They can bring their histories and their aunties and their communities and their collections and their beliefs with them. And that is part of who we are. I think that Smithsonian in many ways, the way that the, the um, foreign service, when I go abroad and I'm looking at US embassies now, it's nothing like American representation that I saw even 10 years ago. You can go anywhere and it actually looks like our country. And Smithsonian is in many ways becoming that way, not in just appearance. This is not about diversity per se. This is about really welcoming people to engage with who they fully are. Um, so I believe this is an exciting time. I also believe it's an obligation given that the American people are, are the ones who fund much of what we do. We are in their debt and we are obligated to follow through in that way. Yeah. Yeah. And is that why you came to the Smithsonian, Anthea? <laughs> um, it, it is actually. Um, I was at a point in my in my life and my career where there was no higher calling than to do my best every day to lead the National Museum of American History. Um, I think to your question, Kevin, it's it's Talmudic for me, right? If it's the classic, if not now, when? And if not, who then? Um, if not us, then whom? You know, shall do this work, shall make these changes, um, shall lead as best as, and as humbly as we can in service, as, as um, my sister director Deborah so nicely said, in service uh, always and in service to the people 
of, of um, the United States and the complexities, as Tay said, of the Americas. I do take it as the charge um, that the Kerner Commission laid out for us, that David Walker laid out for us in his appeal in, in 1830, that Phyllis Wheatley, you know, did uh, two generations before um, the fundamental needs of a democratic and civilized society are domestic peace and social justice. Nice. And I'll give, uh, give the last word to you, Kevin. Um, are uh, our museums going to change the world in the way we'd like? Sorry, uh, I think so, actually. Um, I think they already have in many ways. I think some of what uh, I see at the Smithsonian, and I'm uh, newly here, um, is is that kind of change, that kind of transformation. And what I think I what I love about it is that it's physical. You can go into the museum and see the transformation. You can stare out at the Washington Monument, which uh, is our neighbor, and which. Uh, our uh, corona, our crown effect, uh, exactly mirrors the angle of. You know, you can go and see, speaking of the Poor People's Campaign that Alan so eloquently mentioned, you can see in our museum a wall from the Poor People's Campaign in Resurrection City, and I was struck seeing it at all the languages on it, the English, the mm -hmm. Spanish, people talking about and taking democracy in their hands and, and affecting change. And I think the museum does that too, through its collections, but also through its connections. And that's what I think about a lot is, is how we can change how people think of collections. Because you'll recall, there was a moment when people thought the museum not only couldn't be built, maybe even shouldn't be built, uh, but that also it couldn't be filled, certainly. Uh, and instead, what we've found is an outpouring of people who have been caretaking uh, Harry Tubman's uh, handkerchief and shawl and yeah. hymnal uh, for generations, for centuries. Uh, people who had been uh, holding the Poor People's Campaign Wall, they had kept it. Um, and so they came to us and they helped build the museum. And so to me, it's not even just believing in the museum, it's believing in the people who believe in the museum. And that yeah. connection is really crucial to our uh, future and to all of us. Yeah, very nice, well said. Well, listen, thank you all for, for this conversation. Um, I, I enjoyed it very much. I hope that our audience did as well. Thank all of you for joining us this evening. We'd like to especially thank um, uh, the Mellon and Eisenhower Foundations and Alan Curtis for, uh, for bringing us together this evening. Um, please do continue to follow uh, the work of these museums and, and these initiatives and the work of the Eisenhower Foundation. We thank you for joining us and good night.